I hope everybody is doing great and has had a good lunch. To begin with my introduction, I am Ishika Sharma. I assist Gubba Deepthi, the CGO at Gubba Cold Storage in Branding and Communication. Today's webinar on harnessing genomics and modern breeding innovations for developing better seeds is brought to you by Gubba Biotechnology Lab in collaboration with National Seed Association of India. We are so happy to have Mr. R.K. Trivedi, the Executive Director of NSAI with us. The gentleman has done his post-graduation in four disciplines. He has 38 long years of national and international experience in seed production, seed certification, seed quality testing, plant variety protection, and varietal development and release. He's the author of many books. To name one of the best, it's called The Blue Book. Without a further ado, it's time I hand over the space to Trivedi ji. Please tell us something about NSAI and what you feel about this webinar, sir. Thank you. Good afternoon to all. In fact, on behalf of NSI, as well as on my personal behalf, I happily welcome all participants to this webinar, which is being jointly organized by Gubba and NSI to harness the genome, genomics and modern bidding innovations for developing better seeds. As you all know, the National Seed Association of India is an apex association of Indian seed industry, having more than 400 members. We have all big, medium and small level seed companies who are our members. And National Seed Association of India is playing a role of a bridge between the seed companies and the government authorities, seed regulators, research institutions to highlight the issues of industry before them and the, to bring various achievements made by the R&D and government institution for the benefit of the seed industry. And uh, the NSCI's vision is to create a dynamic, innovative and internationally competitive research-based industry producing high performance, high quality seeds and planting material, which benefits farmers and significantly contribute to the sustainable growth of Indian agriculture. In fact, we are working towards the responsible use of biotechnology for modernizing Indian agriculture and enhancing the livelihood of Indian farmers, increasing the general awareness about crop biotechnology among the many stakeholders, technology upgradation, and engaging in continuous dialogue with regulators for the establishment of a transparent, fair, and equitable regulatory system. In this, keeping this vision in a view, this webinar has been organized jointly by us and Gubba. And Gubba is a well-known and well-established name in the agriculture sector, as you all know. And they are working a lot for the benefit of our agriculture as well as for our seed industry. In fact, uh, the, and the, the lead speaker for this uh, webinar is Dr. Rajiv Vasne, who doesn't need any introduction, I think. Gubba and Dr. Vashne, both are well known to the industry, seed industry and agriculture sector as well. The only I will say that Dr. Rajiv Vashne, I had an association, to, I think 15, 20 years back when I was in the government of India, Ministry of Agriculture. And at that time, with, with his knowledge, with his experience, we started some genomic works in the public sector also. And I think uh, um, after that, a lot of activities and a lot of achievements have done by Dr. Rajiv Vashne. Uh, Vasner, I think he, he is such, a, such an imminent personality who will benefit not to the nation. He will now benefit to the global agriculture sector. So with this, I, I, I request Ishika to please go ahead and keep continue this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's time I present to you the CEO of Gubba Cold Storage, Mr. Gubba Kiran, who has been leading the 35 plus years experienced organization into efficient service and cold storage preservation. Over time, he has become the virtual face of Gubba to the Indian seed industry. He has been the key driver in educating pharma companies about preserving the critical products at Gubba. Along with that, he has also been instrumental in creating Gubba from 0 0.7 million to 11 million cubic feet, one of India's biggest cold storage organization with a commitment to provide world-class research, technology, and innovation to its clients by realizing customers' vision and creating creating oneness in the ecosystem. He is inspired to make a difference to people through his study of ontology. 
over to you kiran sir please tell us what tell us about gubba biotechnology lab and what you feel about this webinar sure uh, ishika i mean if you can give me another couple of minutes in the meantime if you can um, um, uh, create about mr rajiv dr rajiv such that uh, i quickly get into my cabin from the car such that i'll have that 2 minutes of time you can uh, 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 create about rajiv to the people sure so about dr rajiv it would be the most exciting and awaiting session of this webinar it is an honor for everybody present here to have one of the most profound leaders and experts in the entire globe to be amongst us dr rajiv vanshne director state agricultural biotechnology center director center for crop and food innovations and international chair in agriculture food security madoc university australia Sir is an agriculture research scientist specialized in genomics and molecular breeding with 20 plus years of service in developing countries in sub-Saharan Africa and Asian region. He has made centrally important contributions towards improving food and nutrition security in India and several countries in Africa and Asia by assembling genomes of 10 major orphan trop tropical crops and other key genomics resources. in pigeon pea chickpea groundnut and pearl millet he has also developed an integrated genomic technologies in crop improvement programs that have already delivered 11 superior crop varieties to some of the world's poorest farmers he is also the youngest agriculture scientist and fourth indian to achieve an h index of less than 100 as per google, google scholar He is the editor of sixteen extremely informative books. Out of several noted awards, he has received the most coveted science award, Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, and the most prestigious agriculture science award, Rafi Ahmed Kidwai Award from Government of India. Recently, Ikrisat won the twenty twenty one Africa Food Prize for the output and impact of tropical legume project. led by dr rajiv as a principal investigator for 7 years in addition to delivering 37 keynote talks and organizing several international conferences and training courses he has presented research and novel concepts related to food and nutrition security in several high level fora such as such as g8 conference in the world bank and a lot 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 more sir on behalf of everybody present here i take the opportunity to thank you for accepting our invitation to educate us on today's topic can you tell us something about this webinar sir thank you very much thank you very much ishka for very kind words and let me welcome and thank all the participants i see many friends many collaborators in the <coughs> list and thank you very much dr trivedi thank you very much kiran and for this invitation from nsai and gubba so ishka i believe that probably mr kran would like to say something and then after yeah. that i would start is that correct so we had yes sir, yeah, yeah. to mr kran yes yeah. in fact um, there is so much to talk about dr uh, varshini like i mean uh, deepthi was really acknowledging ishika uh, a couple of days ago for roping in uh, dr rajiv uh, to the webinar and it's not accident like i mean jab cinema chalta hai to hero or heroine ko definitely dekhte hain and uh, uh, definitely the director producer music lyricist wo to rehta hi rehta but ultimately finally what matters is the heroine heroine which uh, heroine heroine which are there up on the stage and sir uh, it's no i mean this is for everybody like even probably all the 125 29 people who are live here and probably some hundreds of people who will view the recording uh, because gubba seed news uh, thanks to the respect in the indian seed industry we reached to more than 35000 uh, seed fraternity across india and globe and we have been doing since 2007 and uh, so th that allows us to connect with the industry and we we had 500 plus registrations uh, uh, dr uh, rajiv i mean yeah thanks to you and nsai for uh, that uh, uh, penetration into the uh, seed industry we had uh, uh, 500 registrations yeah holding taking forward like i mean yeah i mean um, it's been like 25 years so it's a good time for uh, gubba to become a household name the indian in in the indian seed industry uh, 
virtually we became a generic name in the indian seed industry and household name in the industry gobba ko south and bijao gobba ke paas abhi aaj loading late ho raha hai and that is how people talk at least in hyderabad and we were catalyst for the growth of the indian seed industry from 5000 crores to 15000 crores in the last 20 uh, in in the last few years and um, yeah the only cold storage we are proud that the only cold storage on the planet to house more than 125 uh foundation seed uh, uh companies who store their foundation seed with us i mean like people go bizarre ki samasa companies have foundation seed aise kaise store karte hai aapke paas matlab ya ye matlab mujhe ki mujhe samajh ke bahar hai magar ye ek haqeeqat hai ki aap people store 125 uh, companies store their foundation seed with us and not stopping there like i mean we also set up a germ plasm bank uh where we can store seed up to 50 years 40 years sorry for 40 years we give seed back to your Uh, gen- uh, second generation the only uh, seed germplasm bank in private sector in india and lots of things which we have done for the indian seed industry matlab kafi papad belne pade hai humko matlab matlab naam kamane ke liye matlab jab tab seva karne ke liye and uh, like when the industry was uh, growing and automation of, was the need of the hour and volumes were growing so in 2007 we have unveiled india's first uh, one and a half ton jumbo bag in a rack supported cold storage facility in those days the rack supported cold storage facility was only for pharma and little for food like ice creams etc we were the first to set up that rack supported facility uh, in those days uh, in 2008 not stopping there uh, two, a two ton jumbo bag was also set up uh, i mean for the indian seed industry uh, where we were the first to set up in india in those days and uh, lots of things technical things we backed up like not just operations matlab like the temperature mapping which we bought in the thermal tracking which we bought in and the 21 cfr data logging system none, none of the things were asked by the seed industry to us humne matlab aage se aake kar matlab kar kar chuke ki what next what next our quest always remained what next what next and what next and that is how we we are working with more than 500 seed companies across uh, india in in our gubba and um, lots of things we have done in the quality aspects apart from just preserving seeds like i mean we have a good uh, uh, what you call uh, germination lab sql seed quality lab where we do a typical uh, what you call uh, uh, germination test and so on waha pe bhi value addition kar rahe hain we are also planning out some uh, uh, data inputs uh, data analytics too uh maybe in 6 months down the line we should start off and we i mean a, a couple of months ago we also started mlt multi locational trials and uh, we were the only company in india to have uh, multi locational trials uh, in india uh, in with uh, iot with various uh, agro climatic zones and so on and yeah finally like i mean um, biotechnology lab uh, uh, we have our state of the art biotechnology lab uh, which we have already unveiled to the world and which we are okay this is again i'm formally inviting you all 25th of february is our biotechnology lab inauguration at gubba merchal and it's an open invitation and it's a personal invitation rather please do join us on 25th friday this friday from 9 am to 6 pm any time any time aap ghar jaane se pehle bhi aa sakte hain ghar se nikal ke hamare paas aake then you can go back to your office during the lunch time during the snack time you can just drop in whenever you want it's in the midst of the indian seed industry it's at mechal so 9 am to 6 pm do drop in any 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 time and um, yeah like i mean like uh, i keep keeping i keep talking to the uh, the world about um, when we started this um, biotechnology lab especially that will serve the sme sector the mnc companies because of their uh, thinking and the vision they have their uh, biotechnology biotechnology labs in house a big companies do have but india is also surrounded by the small sme sector especially to them and also to the big companies this biotechnology lab will come into hand we we do testing like a typical testing like uh, uh, mgot dna fingerprinting mas and so on of course lot will be talked about the importance by dr uh, rajiv and finally before i end up and hand over it to mr rajiv i keep saying one thing the seed industry is emerging it's it's migrating by the year and but a long way to go like how the west uh, the in the in the west everything is outsourced like i mean the biotechnology lab or the production or the processing and the cold storage the logistics everything is outsourced the thinking and the thinking and the vision of a, fi- a fortune 500 companies that's what i keep telling to the seed fraternity in my in my meetings and telling ki 
stick to your core competency stick to your r&d stick to your hr stick to your sales stick to your marketing stick to your branding stick to your core activities and leave the non core activities to people like us where we can add 10 times more value we will uh, add that important uh, air under your wings when you are flying i mean we talking about the, the seed allied sector including like, like people like gubba we will add value to the indian uh, seed industry um with this i will stop here i have uh, because most i am a, a very small side actor role in the whole event the main hero is dr rajiv so i am handing over uh, it to ishika and dr rajiv thank you thank you so much so now everybody the most exciting and awaited session of the webinar is to begin without any further ado dr rajiv hand over, handing this over to you thank you ishika i think that uh, you can see my slide yes sir yes sir okay yes, sir. good before i start let me congratulate uh, gubba group of companies and as karan mentioned i think that they have made really big uh, achievements for the seed industry for indian agriculture so we would like to congratulate you karan bhai for all your hard work and your vision basically and now this is really good that you are having engagement of more than 500 seed companies which is very very much required and also would like to congratulate nsai dr trivedi that they are really doing good work and i think seed is very important and that's the reason that even in this presentation i'm talking about that how we can develop better seed so seed is the important vehicle for tra translating transferring the technology from lab to field and i think for doing these things and if we would like to help small holder farmers agriculture in any country it's really required that we need to work together for that either this is public sector private sector and seed industry and the different starts of etc i feel very happy that when in india all these things are really coming up very nicely so my best wishes my congratulations to gubba as well as nsai thank you very much karan and uh, ishika and dr trivedi for inviting me here and here in this presentation i will give some of our work or share some of our work which mainly has been done at ecresat and our collaborating partners many of you may be knowing that i have moved down to murdoch university because i believe that science of scientist do not have the boundaries to contribute from one country to other country and science is something that when you do something you have the international public goods and they can be translated from one country to other country we need to have the resources we need to have the technology and from this perspective i find that australia here in the murdoch university this is a really fantastic place so i think that from the murdoch university this is my first public uh, webinar lecture so i feel also very excited and honored and uh, yes so what i'm going to do that in this presentation i will share some of our ideas and views though i will give the example of some crops but basically these examples of these technology they are applicable to any any crop or so now let's see from the public sector perspective that why we are so much keen about agriculture we all know that agriculture in all over the world and more specifically in developing countries is facing lots of global challenges climate change is one of them land degrade is another one and there are many other things but one of the key thing that why we do this thing because we are having continuous population growth and i will not go in the details but we all know that if we need to feed 10 million people by 2050 we need to produce 74% more food and from where we can bring this will come only from the agriculture and then from the and especially in the developing countries where that agriculture is done by small holder farmer then this becomes much more challenging and this is the region that we need to bring these different players together as karan mentioned and uh, dr trivedi mentioned and other people mentioned so i think that this is really important now how we can do it and i think this is good that gubba they are having this now in inauguration of this biotechnology lab and i think that many of you will be visiting this thing as well so but before that i would like to take you one step back i think during last 100 years since after this mendel's rediscovery or so or maybe that start of the 19th century so we 20th century so then we started to have that crop improvement program and base crop breeding related thing 
And what crop improvement? Mainly the crop breeding, but allied disciplines including physiology, entomology, and uh, pathology, many other disciplines. They are working together. And what we have been doing that they have been developing the varieties, high quality seeds through integrating or improving the disease resistance, enhancing the crop productivity or pest resistance, developing the varieties which are environmental stress tolerant, having the high nutrition sustainability. This is going fine, not fine, but I mean that they have been doing great work. But I think that uh, we need to enhance the space further. And during last 10, 20 years, there are lots of advances in the technologies and they have been very, very helpful to improve agriculture. And I will highlight some of these things. And I think among different biotech innovations, all the different technologies are important, but I'm not saying that this is more important or the other important. But what I would like to mention that I think in recent advances, and this in the genomics area where you can sequence the genome of any crop, you can understand the genes, the basis of any trait very easily. But until recently, this has been restricted to many advanced research institute or higher or big city industries. So I think that what we need to do now, this is the time that we need to have the democratization of the sequencing technology. And now once we have this sequencing technology, you can use that population germplasm from the different uh, gene bank or breeding program. You can do the sequencing, genotyping, phenotyping. We need to do multi-location phenotyping. And this is really good that Kupa also is in, in this process of multi-location phenotyping of that elite materials. But here I'm talking about more the discovery component. And once we have these sequencing, genotyping, phenotyping, etc., Nowadays, we can develop the pen genomics, we can do the high density genome wide association studies, we can identify genes or markers associated with the trait and we can use them in breeding prompts. So I think this is that now they, nowadays the framework that we need to move on and to address this thing and I would like to highlight that we have used these kind of technology or so in several crops but here in this presentation I will highlight examples mainly in the chickpea, pigeon pea and groundnut. In India, there are many, many important crops, including wheat, rice, beige, etc. But here I'm highlighting these things because these are the crops that are grown in the marginal land by small older farmers. And the crop productivity has not been very high, unfortunately, because of number of regions, there is not much investment, there is not much excitement or interest from the private sector, etc. So, but nevertheless, what we have been doing that together with partners, we have been working on these crops. So I would like to highlight some of these things. Now let's start the 12, what kind of innovation? Because the topic of my talk is about the genomics and breeding innovation. When we talk about the genomics, then basically we are talking the genome and the genome sequence, etc. And then why we need to do that? We need to have the repertoire of entire set of the genes <laughs> for a given crop and we do that one and I think that uh, late uh, last year there were several journals of nature they came together and they were discussing that what kind of impact genome sequencing has made I happen to one of those advisors from the crop science perspective and then in this issue they have discussed that sequencing technology they have not just helped medical or human genetics and livestock improvement etc but plant or crop improvement also a lot and how we can do it i will i like to give some example <coughs> when you want to do some work and would like to use this modern technology as i said you need to have the genome sequence in your head as i said earlier majority of time the genome sequences were coming from that advanced research institute very expensive technology etc but we have demonstrated while working in india that one can deliver one can lead genome sequencing efforts not in one crop two crop three crop we have demonstrated this thing more than 10 crops through our form where i used to work earlier now i will say former former center of excellence well my former organization or my former center, Center of Excellence in Genomics and Systems Biology. And we have developed, decoded the genome of pigeon pea way back in 2012, even the sequencing technology, they were not very advanced at that time point. The Illumina sequencing technology, this was having just 36 base pair reads. Similar kind of work we did in the case of chickpea, pulmonate, two genomes of peanut or tetraploid groundnut, uh, and two different genomes and also the tetraploid groundnut and not only that one 
many other tropical crops including sesame, moon bean, ajuki bean, jatropa, pea, in some of these things we are having really good collaboration from many partners from China, Korea, Asia, India, etc. So what I want to tell that we have delivered that decoded the genomes for more than 10 crops and this is a big thing I think for that uh, so-called orphan crops where we did not have the resources, we developed the resources. Genome sequence is one of them, but while doing this thing, we have developed large scale resources, including gene expression, plus, et cetera. But I will come back later. Now, one more thing, because there are always technological innovations and we keep, we need to keep on embracing the new technology. So initially when we have these genome assemblies, at that time point, they were the best one. But now we have the new technology called high c or 3D genome sequencing technology. And we have used this technology and we have improved our reference genome of pigeon pea, chickpea, etc. And then by using these technology, we have shown that, well, if you use the modern technology, you can have the chromosome length um, genome assemblies, etc. So I think this is the way that we can keep on moving. And uh, so this is one. Second is that once you understand the reference genome, that's great. But now you need to understand the genetic variation. When you do the plant breeding, then creation and utilization, creation, assessment, and utilization of genetic variation is very much important. For plant breeding applications, what we did that we sequenced 300 pigeon pea lines. They were coming from the different parts of the world. We also did the phenotyping. And by combining these phenotyping and sequencing data, we identified many genes or markers associated with the different traits. We did similar kind of work in the case of chickpea, where we sequenced more than 430 lines, we have evaluated this thing for yield, for agronomic traits, especially related to the climate change, yield under drought and heat stress, etc. And one of the key thing was that this was last year that we have not just sequenced few hundreds, we sequenced at 3,366 genomes. This was the largest plant genome sequencing project so far in any crop or so. And then this was highlighted not only the science, but in the general public media, at least 60 different media houses, they published this thing, including New York Times, The Economist, and many other journals or so. And I felt very happy and excited, including that cover page interview in the Biotech Express, etc. So I think that what I want to tell that these kind of world work, when you are not reaching just to the scientific community, but even creating the public awareness, this is very important and this, then society, policy makers, they can appreciate the value of this upstream science that how this can be used in the crop improvement, etc. In summary, what this sequencing project provided, this has provided a lot of stuff, but in key, this provided the genetic variations in the cultivated genome, wild species genome and chickpea, you may be knowing about desi, kabli, etc. And on, I will talk one thing that uh, rather two in this one from this project. One is the pan genome. What is pan genome? If you sequence only one individual, you will be able to target the genes of only that individual. But if some disease resistant genes or drought tolerant genes, they're not present in that individual, you may miss it, right? Therefore, we need to have the pan genome. Pan genome means for a given species, you need to sequence larger number of individuals. You need to compile, you need to have the repertoire of the entire species or so. And that's what we did in the case of chickpeas. So for instance, our reference genome sequencing project that had only 28,000 genes, but when we did this pen genome, this has identified 1,600 more genes out of that 1,582. They were potentially novel genes and they're related to many interesting traits. So I think this is really important. The other thing is that we, we have some archaeological evidences where chickpea was originated, how did it move, migrate, etc. But based on the DNA, we have identified, established the center of origin of chickpea in the fertile crescent. We also have established the fact that how this moved into the different parts of the world and our study analyzed or say that this happened in two ways. That one is this one path moved or chickpea moved from to the South Asia and East Africa. Second one moved to the Mediterranean region and also to the Black Sea and Central Asia through Afghanistan and then this was entered even in India. So the chickpea which was coming through Afghanistan or so, that was the black one or gold seeded, this started to be called Kabli chickpea because this was coming to that here. And after that, then this started to migrate to the new world or so different parts of the world. Even based on this thing, you can understand the species divergence that how the species divergence happened between these different species 
So these are some basic analysis for the genome evolution, biology, etc. But thing is related to the breeding, related to that how you can develop the better variety seed. What happens when people talk about the biotechnological innovations or even the breeding or marker assistive selection? They always try to keep on accumulating the good genes, the good alleles for the different traits. This is in our study identified that or we have given the concept also of the deleterious alleles, the genetic loads and shown this thing that in any crop and there were some studies in some other crops also available like cassava or so, but now not many. But then our study has shown that even you talk any crop species elite varieties, they are the good genes, but they are also carrying the deleterious effect alleles. This is called genetic load and we have given the concept that in the case if you would like to enhance the yield, if you would like to have high quality seeds, high yielding variety, high yielding variety seeds, not only you talk about the accumulation of the good alleles, but also you can take care of reducing or purging the deleterious allele. And nowadays you got the approaches through genomics assisted breeding or through gene editing. So I think that this is new way to do the things. So we have done this genetic analysis as well. And we gave this. So basically we did a lot of genomics work now. And I'm not going in the other areas, but now because my objective of this talk is to demonstrate that how you can use these technologies in developing high quality, high yielding seeds. After genomics, now you need to understand the genetics of the traits in which we are interested. So for instance, yield or disease resistance or anything. For that, we need to have the cost effective genotyping platform. If you would like to have the breeding program utilizing these genomics tools, you need to have the cost effective genotyping platform. For that, we have developed markers, a range of the marker genotyping platform starting from SSR, DART, GBS, CASPER, 56,000 SNP arrays, whole genome pre sequencing, 10 SNP panel, 2000 SNP array. And these, you can ask the question why so many panels? Because if you would like to do the genome analysis at the deeper level, then whole genome resequencing is required. If you would like to do the GWAS analysis, probably 56,000 SNP array. If you would like to have the biparental population mapping, maybe GBS or 2,000 SNP array will be good. Or if you would like to do the marker assisted selection for a few genes for the forward breeding, the forward mark, foreground selection, 10 SNP panel will be very cost effective. If you would like to go to the background selection, or the genomic selection, you can even do the work with the 2000 SNPs or DART markers, etc. So I think depending on the objective, you can utilize these technologies. So this is one that you can sequence, you can genotype these different populations. Now, the next thing is we need to undertake the phenotyping. Phenotyping can be in the field based multi-location phenotyping, etc. This is great. We need to think like that. But nowadays, there are also lots of advances where you can use aerial phenotyping platforms you can use the ground phenotyping platforms and these thing platforms can be used to undertake large density phenotyping etc even at uh, icris at my former place we used to have different kind of extensive phenotyping platform including the drought tolerance for lazy skin lysimeter field and i think last year we also have undertaken this phenotyping at the next level where we have included in the drones and by using flying these drones on the plot level, etc., and then we can do the yield assessment, etc., of the different plots or different trials. So I think this is another thing. So anyway, so now once you got the genome data, phenotyping data, we put these things together and we use the approaches like linkage and association mapping. And then we are not going the details, but by doing these analysis, you can identify genes or markers associated with the trait. And then we have mapped. By using these kind of things, we have mapped 20 to 50 traits in chickpea, groundnut, and pigeon pea. And I will show that uh, how we can use. So I think that this was uh, this is the second component of my presentation. First was genomics technology. Second is how you use the genomics technology to understand the genetics of the trait. So this is the trait map. Now, third component is translational research. How? you can do this thing in the breeding program, either the public sector or private sector breeding program, which is key that how we can integrate these innovations. In this regard, as he said, so once we identify genes, we need to take them to the field. And for that, we have a range of that 
technology or approaches genomics assisted breeding including marker assisted back crossing marker assisted recurrent selection genomic selection approaches etc and i will like to highlight in fact b gives a concept of the genomics assisted breeding way back in 2005 and i think under genomics assisted breeding you can put several approaches together marker selection marker assisted back crossing marker assisted recurrent selection and then we also have given another concept of that genomics assisted brain 2.0 because the general trends in plant science asked after 15 years that how this technology evolved and we say that gab 2.0 will have the haplotype based breeding approach genomic selection approach and in the genomic selection also optimal contribution selection third is the gene editing and we say that for breeding you need to have the gene editing for both purpose one is promotion of the good alleles second is removal of the bad alleles so you can call them page or race so like promotion of alleles through the gene editing removal of alleles through the gene editing and nowadays you might have heard a lot about the speed breeding if you combine these speed breeding with any of these technology you can really speed up the progress in development of the varieties or so by using the first set of the genomics assisted breeding again by using the genomics or so and increase that and our partners we develop the first set of the high only groundnut varieties what happens in the oil, groundnut oil if you see you are having palmitic acid linoleic acid and oleic acid so basically linoleic acid is not good for health because this is the polysaturated fatty acids some varieties from united states or so are having more than 90 percent oleic acid which is good for health what we did that we're using this genomics assisted breeding we have changed the varieties and you can see in many of these lines now more than 80 to 90 percent of the oleic acid and these varieties out of these things two grnr4 and grnr5 they were released in 2020 and those two varieties they were also dedicated to the nation by own devil prime minister modi now not only that one we have used this approach in chickpea and generally so far in many other crops when you use the biotech approaches people are trying to do these things disease resistance which is relatively better trade but in the case of chickpea we have demonstrated that even for drought tolerance we have developed these varieties and this variety jelly 2 was released in topia pusa chickpea 10216 was released in india this was in collaboration with the Quinn institute of agriculture research this is with iri with dr bhardwaj and then some fusion wilt resistance which is a disease thing and now we're using these approaches we are also successful to deliver future of interest and variety in collaboration with us raichur and also in iri new delhi and not only that one even the 2021 there were three other varieties drought tolerant and future of wilt they came through the collaboration of iri iipr etc even the 2021 honorable prime minister modi when he was dedicating 35 varieties to the nation then two of these varieties they were also part of the set so i think that this is the thing same thing in the case of pigeon pea we have demonstrated this thing that you can use these technology to deliver the better varieties so i think i was trying to demonstrate that when you use these concerted efforts for the genomics technology you can deliver the results even in so-called orphan crops including chickpea ground and pigeon pea. now the next thing is that where from where from here where we would like to go and we have given the concept of the fast forward breeding framework and in this fast forward breeding framework we say that we do not need to talk just genes now we need to go one step further and in one of the approach called haplotype based breeding so we need to identify the genetic variants of the different genes and then we need to identify the good haplotypes and then we need to put this thing in the breeding program similarly the genomic prediction when you are having the population instead of screening those population with one or two genes we need to do the whole genome profiling and we need to predict the yield based on this whole genome profile and then there will be another approach called optimal contribution selection and here in this approach that how we can use the land races of the gene bank material without the sacrificing the yield so we need to have a really good combination of the parents and we use this optimal contribution selection the other approach is the genome editing which is a very popular approach and as i told that you need to combine these things with the speed breeding then you can develop the better varieties high yielding varieties and we already started to do this work now for instance this is the haplotype when you are having the sequencing data for a large number of genotypes here you have the genes you identify the different haplotypes and then you link or do the haplophenoanalysis 
do the comparison or analysis of these different haplotypes and phenotypes and try to identify the good haplotypes. So, for instance, in the gene 1, H3 haplotype is best one, gene 2, superior haplotype is H1, gene 3, haplotype H3 is the best one. Then we ask a question, in the elite varieties, which haplotypes are missing, the good haplotypes? And if we find, oh, for gene 1, this is having the H2 haplotypes, on the other hand, the best haplotype is H3. Same thing for the gene 3, you got the haplotypes H4, but then we need to have for gene 3, the best haplotypes is H2. So then we need to use these haplotype approaches and we call it haplotype based breeding. In fact, in the case of chickpea, again, what we did that you remember I was talking about 3000 chickpea lines, and this was the project which Dr. Trivedi also mentioned when he was the, with the Ministry of Agriculture. And thank you very much, Dr. Trivedi, Dr. Asis Vahunasar and many other people. So then we started some project. And when we did this chickpea analysis, so sequencing of 3000 chickpeas, also phenotyping at six different locations for two different years, we put all these data together and we, after that, we try to identify the haplotypes. And based on these haplotypes, we have identified that, well, you are having, and we did the haplotype phenotyping analysis, we identified about that 56 promising lines that are having the better superior haplotypes in the case of chickpea. And recently, when Honorable Prime Minister Modi, when he was digitally said, we were very excited to see in the chickpea field and testing some of those lines, which we have delivered or identified through in progressing or through identification of those haplotypes. So, so I think that these are really very exciting approaches that you can have these kind of haplotypes and now this is the time that we need to use these haplotypes in the breeding program. The next approach is the genomic breeding and here we use the optimal contribution selections. So how you need to identify the parent lines and I think that for these things we need to have the simulation approach, prediction approaches. Similarly, we can use a different kind of genomic prediction models and we have been working on the different type of that genomic prediction, including that machine learning and artificial intelligence based approaches, HOGEM approaches based on the breeding values, based on the haplotypes and different things. And our idea, our strategy indicate that when you have these sequencing phenotyping data, you can identify the new parental combinations and we are having this some idea that you can enhance the yield up to 23% on that what we have right now. How we are moving ahead? So in the case of legumes at Ecreset, when I was there with my colleagues or so, we have initiated several of these programs. In the case of chickpea, for instance, we have done the first round of these haplotype, uh, sorry, genomic predictions. Same thing in the case of groundnut. And in the case of pigeon pea, based on these things, we have identified that uh, we have established the fact that we can use these genomic prediction. And I think for the discovery, this is really important work where that Indian seed industry, Indian public sector breeding program, they need to come up. They need to work with this different concerted efforts with the startup companies, et cetera, that how we can take this material, the phenotyping, genotyping, data analysis. I think data analytical thing is very, very important in the current scenario. So we need to move ahead. Now, the last thing which I would like to tell, so this was about that fast forward breeding that how you can develop the better varieties. Now, the next thing is that many researchers, they forget about the delivery system where seed industry and many other stakeholders, they play a very important role in the developing countries. When you have the elite varieties, seed system is not very strong. So they are not reaching to the farmers, but thanks to the seed industry, especially in India, where we got these small medium and seed companies or so and they are really doing a great work that but because of their effort the seed is reaching to the smallholder farmers now what we believe that this seed system seed delivery system needs to be strengthened in any country either bringing the public sector or private sector but this needs to be strengthened and farmers need to have the varieties replaced after every three to five years we should not have in the farmers field the older varieties india has done a great job by replacing 20 to 30 years, they brought this time to about now 8 to 10 years in many crops in many states or so. Now, the next thing is that when you are having these seeds reaching to the farmers, then farmers need to be provided the decision support tools through their mobile technology, etc. They need to be told that, well, when they need to do the seed sowing, when they need to do the spraying, when they need to do the irrigation. So I think farmers need to be well equipped with this better agronomy. If you are providing just better seeds, not agronomy, you cannot harvest that better yield. 
Then many times we are also having the reduction is the post harvest losses, etc. We are having a lot of other thing. And I think that's what the Gubba has been doing, not only this side, but I think that if you are having the enough amount of the cold storage or so, you can really reduce this kind of thing as well. But anyway, the next thing is that when farmers are having the seeds of these produce in the field, they need to be connected to the markets. This is also very important thing so that these profits also reach to the farmers. We also need to think that how we can do the value addition, we can have the processing so that we are not just talking the benefiting the farmers, even the consumers, they may also be beneficial. And we have given this concept of the rapid delivery system recently in this nature biotechnology. We have done similar kind of work in many other areas and I would like to highlight this particular flagship project from the Gates Foundation led by ICRISAT in collaboration with CIAT, IITA, other CTR institute with the 15 different countries, 13 countries in Africa, two countries in Asia, India and Bangladesh. And I happen to be the PI of this project for about seven years. And this project was in the different phases, $67 million investment for six different crops. 15 different countries so this is a huge investment but now by using the traditional or molecular breeding approaches etc this project facilitated to develop 266 improved varieties 497,000 certified 6 6.1 million ton grains and we have documented this knowledge in the different journals and books but one of the key important thing is that we were working with the private sector in that part of the world and we wanted to have the functional seed delivery platform so that even when project goes out, then how this seed delivery platform, or they can continue to work with that farming community and the farmers are having continuous delivery of the seeds. This project made a lot of impact. And for this impact of this project, ICRI said my former institute got that Africa food prize in 2021. So we feel very excited, very happy about that one that well. Our work has been recognized at all the places. Friends, I want to summarize my presentation by saying that as I showed in this presentation, I was giving the three different parts in the initial thing, genomics, genetics and breeding, which are the key for accelerating crop improvement. Then I moved the new framework about the fast forward breeding, where we talked about the haplotype based breeding, we talked about the genomic selection, OCS also the gene editing. Then I was talking from the public sector perspective that rapid delivery system is very, very much required. And this is really required and that I think that seed industry, this can play very, very important role. So NSAI and Gubba, they are having really important role to play. They are already working in this direction. Next is the farmer's access to the better markets, value addition, food and processing. And this will generate more income to the farmers and deliver better products to the consumer. Lastly, in my opinion, international agriculture agencies, they need to continue to train and develop the next generation of crop scientists, empower farming communities by implementing farmer-centric agricultural policies. And I think, as I said earlier also, international, national and local government agency support is really required when we are talking about addressing the global challenges. And with these things, I think I removed my thanking slide, but I think that thanks to all the partners from ICRISAT and collaborators, all over the world and we are really very excited i'm thankful to all my colleagues and collaborators thanks for all their efforts thank you very much and i'm back to you now here ishika so yeah so i don't know that how you would like to take up the question would be very happy to take any question sure sir thank you thank you for that informative presentation sir thank you for your time and now the q a session is left open so anybody who wants to impose a question and want to get answer please put it in the Q&A box and sir, I'll read the question and you could answer. Sure, sure, sure. Thank you. Okay, sir. Yes, same. There are already two questions. Two questions. Yeah. Yes, the first one I think is for all the participants. Will you be sharing the presentation slides after the session? Yeah, so I think this will be available and as Kiran was mentioning, so we will be having the live stream available in the different channels and people will be very happy to go through that one. So this is Fantastic. Okay. Okay, sir. Next, with private seed industry perspective, I have a question related Okra GWAS. What would be your suggestions for projects such as Okra 
such as okra gwas where very less genomic information is available only proprietary genome references available and genome is very complex allopolyd how we need to create gwas panel what is the population size what is sequencing platform what would be the best what sequencing depth we need to go with so thank you this gentleman or madam has not mentioned the name yeah. anonymous attendee but this is fantastic so i think question is very good question and i may not have the answer for all these things but what we need to do so these technology those days were gone that you cannot do these application in allo polyploid okay so you can do these things in allo polyploid there are many examples either coming from the wheat or sugar cane also or the groundnut or there are many other things so this is not an issue now the issue is that creating genomic resources and i think that i have been talking this thing to another presentation also maybe this person is the same so what you need to do that when you are working on those okra companies these all different companies they need to come together they need to have their propriety on their germ plan which is not a problem they do not need to disclose the name they can have the dna they can have the phenotyping data sharing and then once you got the jivas thing you can utilize this thing in the breeding program in the individual companies and i think that this is the way in netherland many seed industries they have done that one and this kind of thing is very popular in the electronics community for instance whenever they are doing the discovery either this is flat screen tv or plasma or something research happens at one place and then this goes to the different companies and then you see that each company start to come with the similar kind of products so i think that this is required but there is a need to be a visionary people vision from these different private companies if they will keep on working in silo things are going to be very challenging so i think that's what i would like to suggest okay sir so next from mr virendra chauhan pod borer control through genomics <laughs> so virendra should be from the your company itself right yes sir so thank you virendra bhai and i think the pod borer so for any trait when you would like to address through the genomics approach you need to have the genetic variation somehow for pod borer in the elite germ plasm in the pulses you don't have much variation available so this the region that you will not be able to have you will not be able or you will have less chances for success however if you bring the introgression or do some pre-breeding efforts bring some genes from that closely related species you may be successful through the genomics approaches when i was at he said we initiated some of these program but if you have the information about the genes which can confer the resistance to the spot borer in my opinion gm or you need to go to the genome editing approach etc so i think that should be the way in my opinion i don't want to stick with one approach or second approach any approach this is conventional breeding marker assisted selection genomics assisted breeding gm or genome editing or pre breeding any approach that can help the breeding program we should be using it okay sir so next is from mr murli what would be the best approach for genomically orphan okra for the conservation point of view okay now i can guess this anonymous attendee is also mr n murli because he is having the next question of okra so why don't you talk sometimes to me we can have a separate discussion i don't have much knowledge about okra but i think that one can figure it out that what kind of genomic platform you need and how you can have these disease resistance because next question also is the across of polyploidy made okra difficult to come up for the resistance i can understand but these are the challenges i don't have much knowledge about okra but what i want to tell that we had the similar kind of issues in other crops as well are there but now this is doable so that's not a problem maybe there's some we need to see what kind of different genomes you have how much similarity you are having whether you need to go to the genome specific technology or so or not so we one can see that one but this is doable okay So next is from Mrs. Purnima R. What do you suggest for the young researchers to concentrate on improving cereals and pulses? How to head? So Mrs. Purnima, yes, young researchers need to keep on integrating, implementing the new technology in their crop improvement program. And I think I am not will not say that well you need to go cereal or pulses because you need to have cereal also. You need to have the pulses also. So we are talking nowadays. 
the farming system where we need to have the different crops integrated. And I think what we need to do, we need to modernize our research, we need to modernize our development, discovery, all components. So I will suggest that let's remain focused or we keep on paying uh, attention on the modern technology. We should keep on embracing the technology. We should not keep on waiting that, well, I will do this thing after five years, three years. And any technology which can make life easier, we should be using the technology. So that's what I would like to suggest, Mrs. Poonman. Okay, sir. So next is from an anonymous attendee. What is most cost-effective platform for background selection for trait interrogation? Yeah, so this will depend that how many markers you need. So for instance, if you need and uh, few markers, and I cannot specify the different platform, I can mention and I see one of my other friend also Akhtar Ali in this presentation who is coming from Intertech. When I was at Eclipse said I was leading a project on high throughput genotyping platform and as a part of that project together with Intertech we developed the cost effective genotyping platform where you are having 10 SNP panel you can have the 30 SNP panel 100 SNP panel and depending on your crop depending that which how many markers you would like to screen you can use any kind of platform so we need to see that cost effectiveness and uh, as i said so you can use a different kind of panel so i think 10 SNPs panel, 30 SNPs panel, and for background selection, if you just need 100 SNP marker, you can go ahead. Nowadays, there are many companies that are coming up with these kind of platforms. Okay, sir. I see people posting in the chat box. If the request, please post in the Q&A session. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, sir, another question. GEO, is it considered for organic cultivation? What is GEO or G, is it considered for organic eyes? So I don't know, Mr. Vaksi, can you be more specific? Do you want to say GMO or what is that one? Okay, Virendra, we already talked that yes, pod borer is warning issue in pulses and I think people need to have the concerted efforts either through pre-breeding or through the GM approaches. There are some good events also available in the public sector. So people need to go in that also. Thing. Right. Sir, another question. What is most cost effective? Okay, I think it's we already a addressed question. Them. Yes, yes. Miss Ojol Kaur and Anonymous Attendee, they are the same people. Okay, got it. Yes, yes. Uh, next, what is your view on GMO? Why it's delaying in India? <laughs> okay. So I I so I will not go in these political questions or so because the thing is that there is no major issue, but I think there is some policy related issue. And I think that government is moving ahead. And I think that once we got some clarity and nowadays this is the reason that they don't. And I think this is also I'm trying to answer the question, Mr. Hemang Vaksi also. So genome editing thing. So for these technology, they are very powerful technology. India has already uh, harvested the potential of the genomic GM technology in the case of cotton. And this is a big success story around the world, though you can see several stories and they are criticizing. But as a scientist, as an individual, I feel that India has done a great job and reaped the benefits of the GM technology. But at the same time, in many food crops, now even many countries in Asia, including Philippines, Bangladesh, they already have released even the GM rice, the golden rice, etc. So I cannot say anything at that political level or the national policy level, but I can just tell at the scientific level that these technology, they have really good potential. In many cases, this is already demonstrated. And I think that these, it will be good that we all can harness the potential of any kind of technology, either this is GM, or genome editing or any kind of technology. Okay. How effective is GEBWs while selecting parents for crossing plan? Oh, yeah. So like in the case of genomic selection, we always use the genomic estimated breeding. And uh, we already have shown that prediction that how good prediction we are having. So sometimes you need to train your model in much more better manner but i think this is doable and you need to have really good understanding of computational analysis different models simulation and we can do it 
Okay. So next, my question is regarding cytoplasmic penalty in CMS shedders problem. Yeah, so this is important point. And in the case of pigeon pea, where we are having the cytoplasmic male sterility based hybrid breeding system, and we have also demonstrated that how you can use the genomics technology to, to basically strengthen the CMS technology, diversification also. And once you are having this seed, that how you can use this assessment of the purity, etc. So I think that this is required and we need to think in this direction as well. Okay, so next is from Mr. Prashant. What is your perspective about bioinformatics in agriculture sector? Yes, so Prashant, as I said earlier, so we need to have the integration of different disciplines. So we just do not need to think breeding or pathology or genomics or biotech or bioinformatics separately. These need to be integrated. When we are talking about simulation, when we are talking about prediction, all these things that are required when we are talking genomics data, so they, they need bioinformatics approaches. And I think this is really very much required. We need to do it. Okay. So next is from Dr. P. Mukesh. What are the most machine learning tool works for the production of grain mold tolerance? Yeah, so Mukesh, this will not just like that one that you use the tool and this can provide you the data. For that, first is that you need to have the high density phenotyping data for the different traits in which you would like to use these machine learning tools or so. Second, there are several tools. You can see some review paper or so, even including in one of our trends in genetics paper, we have reviewed that what kind of approaches one can use. Third, once you got these approaches, then you need to develop your own models. You need to develop your own scripts and then we can work on those aspects. Okay. In addition to GEBW, do we also need to consider trait inheritance? Yeah, why not? I think that what, for instance, when we are talking about the genomic prediction and those when you are calculating GVV, so these things are already estimated and this is already considered. So we do that one. Okay. I'm really enjoying the questions interaction with large number of people. That's very good. Thank you, guys. Okay, sir. Next is from Mr. Dio Mishra. For disease resistance perspective, how do you see possibility of linking of pathogen genome sequence information and plant genome sequence to utilize that to predict pathogen evolution well before a virulent yeah. wave becomes widespread? Thank you. Thank you, Deo Mishra. I, that's a very good question. And this is something that we need to have the vision for that. And uh, I think this is not reality right now, but in coming years, this is going to happen. And what they are trying to do, as we know that in the human system, genet when we are talking about even these vaccination, etc. So sometimes when we have these vaccines right now, then what people are talking that, well, you have got this vaccine for this particular strain, that's okay. But if some new strain evolves, then how things happen? So like in the case of human side, people are trying to do or thinking that can be develop those kind of vaccines that when you are having the evolution in the pathogen, and then there's also be some fine tuning in our immune system or these vaccine can do. So this is kind of thing. Human genetics is doing the same thing. Some groups, I do not remember exactly in rice in China, they have done, tried to do this thing. So they're putting the system in such a manner in the rice plant that from the host side, that whenever you are having a strain, particular strain, and if there is some mutation there, then how you can change the system and plant immune system. So I think this is a really good approach and this will take a while, but I think this is going to be the approach of the future. That's where the science needs to go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dio Mishra for a very good question. Okay, next is from Mr. Srikant. Control measures for wilt, W-I-L-T. Control measures for wilt. You can measure, you can do that uh, for that wilt. You can find, of course, that different kind of uh, fungicide or those kind of thing in the market to do it. But I was talking more about developing the host resistance. And for that, you need to do this thing. We use the genetics approaches. I think that host resistance is most more important. So let's do that. Okay. How can we develop markers for multiple traits in a time effective way if we don't have a ready mapping population? Well, so again, you need to read more. And now think, for instance, one of the GWAS approach is one of the thing that where you don't need to create the mapping population for each trait, you are having the population. 
and then you can do the phenotyping for a range of that uh, um, traits and then you can map that trait okay what is more beneficial bulk segment analysis or gwas for speeding up the breeding program so mr harsal if you got that y parental population if you got the good phenotyping data good tails on the population go ahead for voice segregation analysis this will be cheaper but the thing is that when you will identify the genes from this approach you need to do the validation in the different genetic background jivas will take little bit more time but again you need to see the validation so why so i can so i think that one needs to check so depending what kind of resources you have you can go ahead okay uh how to go for selection and breeding for rancidity issue in pearl metal millet yes so one of my colleague dr rakesh srivastava from ikri said he is working on this aspect and rancidity is a complex issue so rancidity is not controlled by one gene two gene and also even the phenotyping etc so we need to use multi strong approach and some of my colleagues from ikri said they are also trying to do the gene editing approach so i think if they have some idea about the genes in metabolic pathways you can do the switching of those genes or you need to bring some of the genetic variation if you have in the cultivated gene pool you can bring those things so i think that in my opinion genome editing should be good approach provided if you have the real pathways known and do that work okay next is from mr anil <laughs> shinde how to do heterotic groups in maize there are lots of papers available and maize is the crop where people have developed the heterotic groups based on the phenotyping based on the different kind of sequencing genotyping combination of these things i think you need to read some papers and there is a lot of information available in heterotic groups okay so next i'm taking dr rajiv tagar Yes, yes, Rajiv is a good friend of mine. Yes, he will be here. So you could have an interaction. Yes, 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 please. Rajiv ji, I'm sending you a prompt. Hello. I think you need to make Rajiv as a panelist. Then yeah. Hello. Am I am I am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are. Okay. Uh, just one second. Let me share my video also. Um. Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, you know, the organizer uh, Kiran ji and uh, Rajiv. Uh, great to see you again. Listen to you again. <laughs> as all as always, you are totally brilliant and such an inspiration to all of us. and uh, uh, so let me put a question which is uh, you know fit for your stature and uh, my question is about uh, you know we see a lot of uh, the, that whole ecosystem has developed down south whether we are talking about bangalore or hyderabad and all those areas and i'm sure you guys at ikri set have played a very very prominent role uh, in developing that area in developing that ecosystem so uh, how about your uh, original uh, you know uh, Uh, let's say the the home city uh, and uh, how about uh, the north india i mean the whole action is missing here and uh, i mean talking about punjab i know uh, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, it's it's a very uh, disheartening picture and uh, whether it's up or this thing the whole of uh, north india i mean if israel can do do, do such uh, you know great uh, uh, agrigenomics and agribiotech and all that crop improvement i'm sure in north india Uh, we don't have any weather you know there is a bit more of extreme of temperatures up north i'm sure uh, you know all these things can be done so i mean how do you think such an ecosystem could be developed up north and why is it that india is being developed this tractor is just driving on just one wheel of you know a combination of let's say hyderabad uh, uh, bangalore and aurangabad you know a little bit of on that area but how do you think the government machinery or something could be done you know at your level since you are at sort of prominent position now to galvanize this whole system up north and you know let the whole of nation move forward rather than just from one side how do you think this can be done thank you thank you this is very good point and uh, i think we need to have the people like you people like kiran who have the vision and i think that they need to mobilize the community they for that you need to show the value proposition case you need to have the interaction with the policy makers you need to bring those uh, science leaders together including from the ministry of agriculture icr dbt etc 
though there are several institutes of DVT in Northern India as well, but I think, as you said, and I also believe, we can do much more better. And especially when you are talking from this agriculture perspective, my feeling is, if you bring some agriculture, state agriculture universities, agriculture research institute together, have some brainstorming, discuss what we are missing. I think one is, they will always talk about the machine like this infrastructure sector. This may be one thing, but second is that uh, you need to you need to motivate people. And and the third thing is the resources. So and I we did this thing in the HTPG project. So when you are having when you want to integrate the markers in the breeding program, breeders always say, what will be the cost for the genotyping? So the question is that how you can bring the genotyping cost down. When I was in India, we were talking with the chickpea. All India Coordinated Research Project on Chickpea, Pigeon Pea or so. They have fantastic system of ACRIP. You are having that your centers, your evaluation in different climatic zones. And then we say why we cannot use them in the better manner. And I know that Dr. Triya Sarma, the DDG Crop Science, in several meetings, he's also encouraging people in this direction. So I think that if we work together, instead of working in silo that you can do that one. And I'm not saying that you need to ask people not to do it, but you need to work in the coordinated manner. So sometimes people are having this fear. If I will ask that person to do, my job will be finished or I will not be given the credit. So there are a number of reasons. So there may be some uh, issue with that uh, personality dynamics. Sometimes some issue is related to infrastructure. Sometimes some issue is related to I don't know whether I should say that, uh, how should I say that, whether people have enough uh, appreciation of the technology or deployment of the technology. So this is a big question, Rajiv, I understand it, but people need to address that one. And uh, I think that people at the highest level, they need to address this issue. So unfortunately, right now I'm out of India. <laughs> so I cannot have those kind of discussion, but I will remain, I'm still connected with the Indian uh, community that's one of the reason that i have accepted this invitation i really love to work with our own folks or so so i think yeah but again the good question i don't have the solution but people like us we need to have the discussion on this topic thank you very much Rajiv. thanks indeed sure sure sir. but i appreciate your question thank you thank you very much thanks indeed sir, Karan, you wanted to say something Sir Ji, you are not going to be able to do it. No, 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 uh, 2500 ton cold storage facilities, sirf 2500 ton. And uh -huh. of course, the industry now is on uh, maybe a couple of lakhs of tons. It took six, six years for people to know what it takes to preserve a seed mm. in a specialized dehumidified Harrington rule mm. uh, compliant seed cold storage facility. Matlab, people were scared to store their foundation seed with us. People were scared to store, I mean, store their uh, germplasm with us. I'm talking this in late 90s. But of course, uh, things have changed now. The trust has built. We kept upping our game each day and did what's needed uh, for the industry. Uh, because the, the industry uh, uh, have its own thinking and limit, I mean, thinking and also its limitations. So we kept looking the unnoticed things where you don't put your focus there. We, we started developing those same systems and structures such that you can take leverage on our things or infrastructure or systems. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. No, thank you. You did a great job. Thank you. So there are two more questions. World is about to celebrate International Year of Millets in 2023. So what are the challenges India is having seed perspective in preparing to meet the global demands of nutritional security? Well, so for that Ministry of Agriculture under the leadership of Honorable Secretary C. Sanjay Agrawal, sir, they are already moving ahead in this direction. ICRI, SAT, IAEMR, they are already part of that one. National Institute of Nutrition is 
center is the part of that one. I don't see any issue, rather they are moving ahead and you will see in the 2023 that people will appreciate further and India is in the forefront of that one. So we should not think that every time we are having challenges, we are having India is making lots of achievements also. So we should keep on appreciating and celebrating those things as well. So I think this is good, but lots of things are happening. Maybe you will come to know in the 2023 or 20, because I know several things as well. I was involved in some of those discussions as well. So I think there are many things are happening. Good, good things are happening. Okay. Okay, sir. So with your permission, shall we end the Q&A session? This is your so show. Do we so have any, any questions still left out? Like maybe the last. Can we take feedback? Can we have people come on? in the panel and give their feedback. Sure, 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 all is yours. Kindly raise hand for anybody who wants to come interact and give their feedback.